Welcome to Buy the Bywater, a podcast on the Megaphonic Network. I'm Ned Raggett. I'm Oriana Schwint. I'm Jared Pekachak. And we're here to talk about all things J.R.R. Tolkien. His work, his inspirations and impact, creative interpretations in other media, languages, lore, ripoffs, parodies, anything we think is interesting. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 19th episode of By the Bywater. Wonderful to have you with us once more, once again. It's early October 2020, and uh, we don't even know what's going to happen within the next hour from now, much less the next month. So we wish everyone well in what's going to be a time. Yes, yes. I no longer wish to live in interesting times. I don't think I ever did. <laughs> no. But, you know, mm-hmm. we're, we're done. Uh, we'll leave it at that. All previous sentiments expressed this year on various subjects still hold, of course. <laughs> so we will uh, we will leave it at that. I can say that uh, we actually have one cool weather and two no smoke in the air. So yay! yay. Nature, nature is healing. The West nature Coast is what is it he- is. <laughs> and again, or the big news is within, what is it, a week? Two weeks? Oriana will be on on her way here. So, oh, yeah. 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 So when when do you head out from New York off, off to our direction? Uh, I leave. We're leaving October 10th and we'll arrive the 16th in Los Angeles. All right. Ho- so- hooray. Please, <laughs> neither of you guys live in L.A., but no. like, you know, <laughs> blow the fires away if there are any that start, please. <laughs> Yes, no gender reveal Thanks. parties when uh, when oh Oriana goes out there. That's, Please, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, my my deep uh, thoughts on that. So uh, the weather should hopefully be calmer by the time you're there. But October is, you know, that I've 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 dealt with when I lived in Orange County. I you know, you, October fires and fun things could happen before. So you know, just well, welcome to L.A. <laughs> it, it, it should calm down after that. So anyway, so uh, we so yes, yeah, so the next time we'll be talking, we'll all be recording in the same time zone what a joy <laughs> what a what a, a rarity it will be the first time for us all there is some news we hope you're well but let's just go right ahead and move on into things so jared please give us the news take it away there is indeed news and it's good news Yay. about the amazon production with coronavirus continuing to actually be you know fully under control in new zealand unlike some other places we could name mm. uh, their government has fully authorized film crews to resume work Deadline reported that the Amazon team began on Monday, September 28th, with the core writing team using the time off as their previous, previously planned hiatus to plan out and write scripts well into the second season. Beyond that, they're keeping quiet as ever. Though, once again, actress Morvith Clark, thanks to an interview in the NME about her role in St. Maud, was able to share a bit more detail, talking about the size of the production by saying, one guy's job consists just of seeing how dust reacts to footsteps and breath. That would never have even crossed my mind before. <laughs> and uh, beyond that, <laughs> beyond that, <laughs> the only remaining rumor comes from the One Ring.net's Twitter feed saying that they're seeing casting calls for actors comfortable with nudity, quote, and uh, trust us, we've already made all the jokes. <laughs> every last joke, every last one. We, we, you know, Jared and I were coming up with alternate titles, the various things <laughs> involving uh, Tolkien references, and I think Oriana was like, ah! When she I, I, saw, I signed on to, sli- I had missed the, I think I had like dropped in my initial reaction, or maybe even not, and came came back to Slack to like, several dozen messages <laughs> from Jared and Ned making all sorts of um, jokes that we will not be repeating on this no. podcast because this is a family friendly podcast, oh, right? Is it ever. So, <laughs> but I suppose, you know, just to, just to unpack it a bit is that, you know, if there, you know, l- let's assume this is partially real. Maybe it isn't. Um, mm. The idea is, is that, you know, it's, it's one of those things I can see some people going like, how can you have this, you know, in that, and it's sort of like, well, turn it around just because it's Tolkien doesn't talk about something doesn't mean it, you know, doesn't exist. And, you know, Mm -hmm. TV has its own sort of thing. It is a question, I suppose, of how much the estate, you know, how much leash the estate will allow for, I guess, is probably what comes down here. That's unclear, of course. We don't know exactly what that means. I mean, you know, the the attitude may be from Bezos and all down. It's like, hey, look, we gave you a quarter of a billion dollars. We can do what we want. So... (laughs) But also, you know, it, it, it's totally like, like it could just be hiney nudity, like yeah. someone goes swimming and they don't, you know, there's no yeah. swimsuits well, in Middle Earth. Well, I did see something that they were, um, they were hiring an intimacy coach for this. Oh. So it's not, if, oh. if that is true, then it's not just somebody's going swimming. It's, you know. Oh. Um, Weird. Yeah. 
weird, hmm. but that actually, you know, that's actually, dare I say, a good thing to see, given these questions about what is depicted these days and, you know, dynamics on sets, you know, the fact True. that they're at least trying to address some sort of thing. And, yeah. you know, there could be other factors, too. I mean, you know, be blunt here. I mean, uh, it's sort of like we, we, this is, you know, and also part of the Slack chat, too, is sort of like, look, if Numenor is meant to be the fallen kingdom of man, the hyperpower, you know, man's capacity for evil goes all sorts of different directions. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and uh, there, there, there are many different ways that this could go. So it's, you know, it's unclear, you know, talking about slavery in Middle Earth, for instance, even loaded as subjects it might be to put in, mm. is one of those things that uh, could be uh, could be a factor. There could be other things. Who knows? Could just be a tender and intimate wedding night. Who knows? Right? It's not quite the red wedding, son. It's something else. Yeah. What? <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so we will, we, we, these, this is interesting. You know, who knows? Uh, as with everything, we won't know until we know. And who knows when that'll be. Um, but I will say that thanks to uh, Morphe Clark's uh, interview, she is rapidly becoming like, you know, my mascot for this entire thing, just because she is pretty funny in every interview she does. Yeah. She tells amazing stories. My, my favorite other one was the one basically talking about how she and her, like, you know, college friends would basically all sit around and you just, you'll watch all three of the Lord of the, Lord of the Rings films uh, in a row and just the get eye. And, and she's saying, and she had this great comment saying like, yeah, now I tell them I'm going to be in, in a Lord of the Rings production. And they're just like, ah, Ah, you know, it's just you. We were not going to think that. And I'm... You're no Kate Blanchett. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Get you some friends who say you're no Kate Blanchett. Like... Yeah, exactly. These are these are your friends. They they give you crap. <laughs> and they're just yeah. sort of like, you know, that's how they show they love you. So, so you know, even though, of course, we still have absolutely no idea of visuals or anything from this thing, at least we have that. So, one day. She does. She seems fun. Like, and I do, though I do hope, Jesus, give us something, guys. Yeah. I just want some concept art. I know I said this already, but I right? just want just even a little bit. Just give me, like, I don't know. A costume, a costume. Something. I don't, for, a, for an extra. I don't even care what it is. As I a just treat. want to see a costume. Yeah, I can have little a costume as a treat. Mm, mm, yeah, you know, maybe maybe a Christmas gift. Maybe that's their way to oh. for us. Maybe, maybe we'll celebrate with Yule. Who knows? Oh. So, <laughs> until then, though, until then, since we, we do not know. So uh, we will give you more news as we hear it. There's not much else to report on otherwise. So it is now time to move into our main topic for today. And that time around, it is me. So, to begin. The role of biography, as we've said before, is a tangled thing with Tolkien, where his own life, experience, and beliefs play out in different ways across Middle-earth and his other work. Yet one of the most clear examples of this can be found in his stories of family, especially fathers and sons, or more accurately and poignantly, the lack of one or the other. The death of Arthur Tolkien in 1896, when Tolkien was just barely four years old and had already turned to England with his mother and younger brother, had an obvious and profound impact on his remaining family's life, further exacerbated after his mother Mabel's death and his caring, but, as a late adolescent and young man, sometimes strained relationship with his formal guardian, Father Francis Xavier Morgan. Famously, both of his two major protagonists, Bilbo and Frodo Baggins, are orphans, the former's parents seemed to have passed on naturally, but the latter's died in a drowning accident, leading to him being adopted by his uncle. Certainly, there's another key loving relationship between a father and a son among the lead hobbits. Sam Gamgee's father, Hamfast, is a key running character in the opening chapters and at the book's end, and Sam often mentions or thinks of him during the quest. But generally speaking among the Fellowship, characters' fathers are either non-existent, as with Gandalf, present but never mentioned much, as with Pippin, Merry, and Legolas, or very briefly but indirectly shown, Gimli's father and Bilbo's old companion Glowen is presented at Rivendell as well, but no discussion or depiction of their relationship exists beyond that. As for Aragorn, he too lost his father at a very young age, and his own sometimes tense relationship with his foster father Elrond, especially over the prospect of marriage to Arwen, often suggests that of Tolkien's with Father Morgan. But that leaves one other member of the Fellowship, and that leads to the focus of this discussion, as a family and as a representation of their society. Boromir, his brother Faramir, and their father, Denethor. The ruler of Gondor, king in all but name, his older son, the widely hailed warrior, and his younger, the quieter but no less dedicated leader, theirs is a key dynamic that underpins much of the story in both its plot machinations as well as in terms of theme. There's nothing else quite like it in The Lord of the Rings though it is interesting to note those equivalents who have their own shattered families. Elrond's son Elidan and Elrohir join the fight towards the end of the book, 
part of their continuing war against the orcs in memory of their mother, long ago gone for Valinor following a brutal abduction. Meanwhile, we first meet Theoden, already a widower, racked by grief as well as Wormtongue's cozening, thanks to the death of his only child and heir, Theodred, in battle. The relationship between Theoden, his nephew and new heir, Eomer, and niece, Eowyn, is itself worth a closer look, but it is one where conflict and sorrow is tempered by understanding, love, and an eventual sense of triumph even with Theoden's passing. In contrast, Denethor and his sons face a darker road. Boromir is the first introduced in the narrative, and his closest equivalent among the Fellowship might be Legolas. They are both heirs to the throne, in essence, and both are considered to be among their father and their realm's finest warriors as well, if not the best period. But where Legolas has what might be called a quiet pride leavened with evident humor, Boromir's pride is worn on his sleeve. If not exactly a boor, he speaks with authority verging on arrogance in the Council of Elrond, is quick to judge and suspect even when seeking advice. Yet at the same time, he makes clear that Gondor faces greater pressures than anyone else immediately there. Sustained attacks on their shared border area with Mordor, a sense that things are about to get incredibly bad, and that his abruptness clearly also serves as a vehicle for his feelings about Gondor and their people. Yet while he regards Aragorn with a careful eye initially, he understands in the end that the ranger does mean to help him and Gondor to the full, and gladly. But of course, this is not enough for Boromir to escape falling to the Ring's temptation, and soon thereafter through the attack of the Urukai. In moral terms, as Aragorn says at their parting, Boromir does gain a rare victory, but the price is the further shattering of his family. Now, it's a further shattering because Denethor's wife and the brother's mother is long dead, though when Frodo and Sam first encounter Faramir, he is careful enough not to reveal that to the hobbits for some time. As Jared has said before, Faramir is famously the good boy of the book, the closest <laughs> one can come to a paladin in the classic sense. Boromir carries himself well, but evinces brashness. Faramir is the definition of courtliness, careful with what he knows and shares, as befits a leader of a hidden force in enemy lands, but a kind host to his unplanned guests, honoring choices they make that he himself argues against, whether it involves Gollum or their planned path, and ultimately facing his own test with the ring with the understanding and strength that Boromir did not have. It's little surprise in many ways that the Athelian sequence in the Two Towers, where Faramir appears, is one of Tolkien's strongest. He's an ideal of what a weary, worried traveler on a desperate mission would want to encounter, and his observations on his lands and society, the role of the military, how best to honor Numenor's complex legacy, they all make for thoughtful, inspiring words that do linger. Yet that in turn sets up the contrast with Denethor, the final member of the family we meet. Gandalf's warning to Pippin may be an expository trick to a degree, but it's a useful one, conditioning us as readers to gear up and understand that whatever we think of the sons, the father is something else again. And he clearly is, distinct and different from his offspring, certainly possessing Boromir's clear haughtiness, but to a clearly higher degree, where nearly every sentence feels like the pronouncement from a graven image. Not entirely. The mention of the moment where a sudden smile flashes on his face is a memorable one. But there is little doubt that Tolkien makes him the incarnation of the phrase, heavy lies the head, an isolated figure leading a country and a people who look to him for guidance that slowly but surely starts to be lacking. His conflicts with Faramir and his evident and open anger and sorrow that Boromir is dead, moments of incredible tension that, translated into Peter Jackson's adaptation, made for one of the highest moments of true drama in that production is combined with the desperation of the moment to produce what still remains one of the most shocking fates in the entire story, the final fracturing of that family and the new isolation, but with an ultimately different ending, of Faramir. There's a lot to unpack here in the story of these three men, the roles they have, the relationships that bind and divide them, and the reactions to events that inevitably transform or destroy their lives and those of others, at once a family under incredible pressure and the incarnation of a society facing even greater ones. But to go further into all this on my own would mean, not mean this is a discussion. And so it's time for me to open up the floor. And whoever wants to start? I do find it interesting that Tolkien makes a lot of observations about, you know, how people look and how, mm. you know, Faramir is, even though he comes from a lesser line, like very much feels and looks the part of the Numenor, the, the, the royal line of Numenor, mm. let's say. But at the same time, he and Boromir have the same genetic family, you know, and mm -hmm. and I think that's a, that's like kind of a more interesting nature versus nurture type comment than than you might expect coming into this and hearing a lot about sort of the importance of lineage, where because Faramir decided 
early on in his adulthood, boyhood, to Mm -hmm. take, you know, have Gandalf be his mentor, essentially, and to Mm -hmm. learn from him. That has imbued him with all of these traits that his brother and father lack. Mm -hmm. There's this kind of... I don't know if the line itself is famous, but I always think of it because it is such a weird line where Gandalf says that the blood of Numenor runs nearly true in Denethor and in Faramir, but not in Boromir. So it's like (laughs) they have the same mother. So it's like what he's saying is the actual, the real heritage of Numenor is not whatever Boromir represents. Mm -hmm. It's what Denethor and Theramir share. Mm -hmm. And that, that is interesting you phrase it that way, that's a sudden thought that you know, almost crystallizes something is that, as as I hinted at, Faramir's you know, sense of the depths of history and society, for mm-hmm. lack of a better term, is clearly evident. Denethor has it as well, although shaped differently. I'll set that aside because I think that's, uh, that's well worth delving into. Boromir doesn't seem to care as much is mm-hmm. maybe the best way to put it. He has a pride for Gondor, but I'm not just sure he has a pride for Numenor's legacy. If you get what I'm saying, Mm -hmm. it seems to be something that you could argue is more in the moment, like, well, this is us and here we are and I will protect my people in Gondor to the full. Yeah. Whereas it's sort of like, well, there are deeper roots, tangled roots, as Oriana pointed out in the imperialism episode, too. You know, there's plenty we can unpack there. Yeah, it's almost like Boromir is the epitome of the, I'm a New Yorker, baby, <laughs> but not, wow. whereas, fa- <laughs> look. I'm sorry, I'm making Boromir a, long... a cab driver now, going like, hey, what do you want? <laughs> um, you know, without being, without having this sort of accompanying, like, American patriotism or, mm. uh, mm. like, criticism. Now, I don't know how fully baked that thought is. Maybe no. I think I see what you're getting at because it's it's very it's very regional. Yeah. And doesn't he doesn't? If I recall correctly, I did reread all the chapters that prominently feature Boromir and Faramir and Denethor before doing this. But yeah, yeah, I still forget things. Um, Boromir doesn't really talk about the history. Right. He talks about Gondor, whereas Denethor and Faramir are both like we're the you know the long line of whatever has come down to us and uh, wisdom and fading and things like that. And Boromir is just like I want to fight something mm-hmm. for Gondor, and it's it's a very different way of viewing the same region. Yeah, it's a it's a loud it's a it's it's you know to to use a term that would have been new uh, for Tolkien in Tolkien's time, but rapidly became understood. He's a jingoist. Is yeah. what he is, you know. He yeah. is, he is, he's quite literally there, and that leads to questions of you. You sort of have, have mentioned this already, and I think there's something to it. Classic example of not not allegory, but applicability is that yeah. I clearly think that there is a sense of applicability going on with the characters, and this sort of fusion with the state is the best way to put it. Mm-hmm. That though the characters are their own individual characters, he's clearly using them to also represent certain points of view. Mm -hmm. And those points of view very much heavily boiled down. What is patriotism? What is serving your country? For Boromir, Mm -hmm. it's a go out and kill the bad guys. And, you know, not maybe do too much with that, but you're thinking of, you know, and this is where his Temptation of the Ring is important. He's thinking strictly in military terms, the Mm -hmm. power of command, that uh, Mm -hmm. one very striking phrase that he uses, and command being capitalized. Faramir is, you know, famously, you know, does not worship the militarism. He's anti, he's not quite anti-militaristic, but he is very much, you know, he he honors he honors what is behind that. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. the the famous phrase which we used many times about, you know, I I honor, you know, we know the one. I, I do <laughs> yeah. not love the blade for its sharp. Is yes. That, that, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That key one. So you know, for for him, it is for him is that sense of the knowledge, uh, having Gandalf as uh, a mentor. Uh, these things. There's sort of like he's looking for the spirit rather than just simply the mm-hmm. X equals X, right is right. Yeah. Then you've got Denethor, who is something else again. It's the forms that are important, you know. It's mm-hmm. like here I am, you know. Here I am in my chair, and this chair is here, and I will never sit in the throne. And even this this son of mine, referring to that conversation that is recalled, I believe by Faramir about like asking, you know, Boromir saying, "Why aren't we? Why aren't we kings? You know, sorry, you know, we're we're you know, well, other places sure, but ten thousand years have to pass before yeah. that even mm-hmm. happen. happened. You know, this sort of someone who's sort of like it is because it is. This is how it is. And I bring this up because my hunch is that Tolkien, to a degree, is processing patriotic attitudes and approaches and thoughts based on his own experience in World War I. Now, I'm not trying to draw that as a direct line. I'm not saying each of these characters represents people he knew or anything like that. But this seems to me very, very 
deftly suggesting ways in how sort of like, you know, I, I represent, I represent my people, I represent my nation, but how are people coming from that? What are the ways that is shown? How do they differ? How are they in fact in conflict as much as you can sort of accept the other and putting it in a family situation? That's yeah. a lot to, that's a lot to, you're trying yeah, to pack into a small space here. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm scratching the surface rather than really delving deep, but I do think that there's, there's some sort of that essence playing out. Yeah. Denethor is interesting because he's the only, the only really political character Mm-hmm. In, in, not in like not in that he represents real world politics, but that he's the only character who is genuinely concerned with alliances and relationships yeah. and who is doing what and fealty and things like that. And I think it's one of his letters. Even Tolkien is like, this is his essential sin: is that he values Gondor as a polity mm-hmm. more than the greater good. Mm-hmm. He's mm-hmm. he is a nationalist in sort of a, a way that comes across as sympathetic understandable sort of like you get why he would be so proud of this and why he would want to defend this city at the expense of anything else if necessary but it's still like that's not the right point of view to take here dude Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) there's a bigger thing going on it is interesting we don't really get a sense of denethor before you know we never see any hints of denethor before sort of coming under the influence of the Palantir of Sauron mm-hmm. through the Palantir, what he was like before all this, and how that played into the raising of Boromir and Faramir, and did he show an initial favoritism towards Boromir as as young as boys, and Faramir just kind of naturally was like, oh, well, okay, I am more receptive to Gandalf mm-hmm. simply because. Of this, and you know, you have you have that layered over the Ned, as you said, the deep. Oh, they actually represent very different points of view on how things should work. Mm-hmm. I will say maybe that there is actually one exception to what you're talking about, Ariana. Although it is secondhand, it's in the appendices where we learn about bits of Gondor and Rohan's history, where we basically learn about Aragorn as a younger man. Yeah. When he served Gondor. And there is that tiny little bit that's in there basically talking about how uh, he served uh, Ecthelion, the steward, uh, Denethor's mm-hmm. father. And uh, that uh, that Denethor himself was a little wary of this guy, mm-hmm. essentially. He's sort of like going like, eh, you know. And that uh, he's sort of seen as something of a natural rival is almost what yeah. it comes down to due to uh, due to what uh, what Aragorn did. And, of course, his disappearance as he, you know, leaves after that successful battle and goes off to, you know, trick other things takes care of that issue. So, you know, but, of course, we only learn that in the appendices. That's after right. the fact. That's one of those things that's sort of like it's a nice little, you know, fill up. It's an interesting extra detail you could say which does sort of indicate his uh, essential po- like political animalness mm. political animality mm-hmm. and, uh, <laughs> like you know even even back then he's kind of not scheming but looking at influence lo- yeah and who wields it and that kind of Th- this this mention of Aragorn of mine actually leads me to say that of all the characters it's how each it's Aragorn how he cr- specifically Aragorn, how he crosses all of these three members of the family's paths Mm -hmm. and how they react to him is very, very telling. Of course, Mm -hmm. he doesn't do so directly in the narrative with Darenthor. We, you know, but it's, 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 it's seen or at least to be retconned as a lingering influence. And, you know, clearly Denethor knows who he is and clearly he is incredibly suspicious of Gandalf (laughs) for that reason. And, and, and to step back a bit, you could argue that these interactions are what it what happens when three people also who are three points of view who are also three the three key members of the royal family encounter a power who is going to supplant them <laughs> is essentially mm-hmm. this who no matter you know no matter how peacefully <laughs> no matter mm-hmm. no matter with the best intent you know how do they react and you could argue that there's something subtle more subtle than again and Tolkien is often not given credit for this kind of subtlety yeah. for sort of like how do good people react to realizing that they are now going to be to the side mm-hmm. or they may no longer be how will they act to realize that they will now be the steward and not the king and not the king not the not the king in de, in, de, in a de facto the de, sense de, yeah. yeah yeah clearly denethor does not accept it at all Mm-mm. clearly boromir is suspicious but ultimately in the end realizes sort of like you know you are the guy yeah. uh and uh, and faramir when he finally meets aragorn basically treats him as yeah, you called me i am here you know i just you, yeah. you've literally woken up from uh, from the 
spell of the Nazgul. So, uh, and you know, he's he's been saved. So uh, these are all very different and very interesting reactions. It is like Gandalf's influence on all of this is interesting to because it is almost like he was laying the groundwork real early. Uh, you know, he's not responsible for Boromir's death. He's not responsible for Denethor's, you know, turn to madness or anything. But he got close with the guy who was most, you know, would be most amenable to this changing of the guard. Mm-hmm. I, that is interesting. There's Yeah, there's such a weird bleak undercurrent to how Gandalf interacts with this whole family where it's Mm -hmm. like he's Gandalf is a good guy but there are occasions where he has to do this sort of awful cold moral calculus because he's like he's got the bigger picture in mind that nobody else does yeah Mm -hmm. so he's got to be like well I gotta have a friend (laughs) in Gondor I need somebody in the steward's household so not that he says this but and I don't know that it's even implied but like you could read it that way where he knows that he needs somebody at this echelon. So, yeah. oh, well, go with Faramir because he's the one who's who's going to listen. It is interesting that in the, you could say the interregnum after Denethor is gone, uh, that, uh, but before, you know, before the king is fully returned, that uh, that even though Aragorn has come to save the day at the Battle of Minas Tirith, uh, uh, Valinor Fields, uh, that uh, the, pretty much everyone there defers to Gandalf. I mean, they pretty much say like, okay, for the final battle here, it's all mm-hmm. yours, you know, and uh, and notably that includes good old Prince Imrahil, who arguably is the other, you know, the closest other thing to a power in the land who could, if they wanted to, say like, like, hey, you know, I'm in charge. We're we're the we're the next best royal house here, and I'm a prince. So, but he doesn't. You know, he defers. And I think that's that's just one of those interesting little tiny little touches that shows that that you could argue that uh, maybe it's a question of you know, without you know, without the steward, Boromir dead and Faramir incapacitated, there literally is nobody else in Gondor to take their place. And you know, that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty telling subject. I don't want to draw in too many current parallels, but um, anyway. but also, yeah, you guys might want want to think of a more robust uh, form of government, maybe a more robust chain of power contingency plan. Is Line that of succession. Trying? Yes, there we go. Thanks, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> But this also ties in, I mean, we don't want to get too much, as we said before, into a George R. R. Martin world where you start, like, you know, hashing out the taxation uh, <laughs> enforcement right. and things like that. But there is, it also does uh, sort of play to this sense of not unreality, but kind of extreme case that, uh, you know, Tolkien has set up essentially and spells out this, un, this not totally an unbroken line of succession, obviously. there The kings went away in Gondor for a while. But essentially that uh, Gondor was, in ultimate, ultimate senses, ruled by two two dynasties. There was the actual line from Anarion, and then when that ended, there was the line of the stewards. Yeah. Over 3,000 years. Human history doesn't work like that. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, you know, that's, it's, it, it's fine for Middle Earth, but it is an idealized state, and that may explain why it feels more, you know, it, it seems like something that to us might be sort of like, that's not how the real world works. Well, it's not meant to be the real world ultimately in the end anyway. It's, you know, mm-hmm. Tolkien isn't necessarily drawing that type of thing. These are these could be more figural. It does speak, though, to how ossified Gondor is as, as a society. Uh, you know, the way they speak is more elevated than than the Rohirrim intentionally like they seem it seems like a pretty strat like it's a it's a physically stratified society uh there's literal you know tiers of the city mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that is kind of what happens when you have one family in charge for you know a long time and then well technically it's this other family now but that's it <laughs> like right yeah i want to introduce something now focusing on the family dynamic between these three in particular that only occurred to me the other day and i thought about it and thought about it and went i believe this is the case correct me if i'm wrong so we as readers encounter faramir you know by surprise the the hobbits were going to like you know i'm reminded of boromir and all that and then it turns out you know he gives that gentle line you know boromir was my brother and it's like oh wow realizing that But then something, you know, it only just occurred to me now. I'm like, the hobbits and everybody, the Fellowship, they make their way months at a time and all the rest of it. And they know that Boromir is the son of the steward and all that. Did Boromir mention Faramir once? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Why is it such a surprise? I mean, he mentions a brother when he he comes to Rivendell for the first time. He's like, my brother had this vision a lot. 
Okay. I had that's one. true. All right. Okay, but I'm that's still fair. The one who that's went. good because I was wondering, um, I was trying to remember that. Yeah, but I I really doubt that he was like, oh, you know, you know, like on those nights camping or whatever. He's like, oh, you know, my brother and I used to whatever. I doubt he did that. I think yeah. it was just like, oh, I got a brother. He well, and it was it's only because he had the vision first. Mm. He had the dream, uh, and then Boromir had it once yeah uh, faramir had it several times yeah faramir had it once <laughs> so, <laughs> faramir's clearly the chosen one here why are you doing <laughs> right right and that's an interesting thing thinking about you know i don't want to delve too much into the uh, jackson adaptation of this uh because it's better to sort of concentrate on the text uh in this particular case however i do think that there is one interesting little twist that they did um in the adaptation in that uh, when it comes to the dream and all the rest of it is that in the book it's Bormir saying this is my job whereas in yeah. the film if you count the extended edition where this is delved into in the scene that they invent uh that shows uh, that's the flashback scene that Faramir has when Boromir and Denethor and he are all after the a battle in Osgiliath are all talking about the mission that has to go to Rivendell it's you know Sean Bean's portrayal of uh, Boromir is a little more hesitant a little more unsure and he's a little more mm, about Denethor and when it comes to doing the mission Faramir there is like you know doing this and Boromir is essentially going like by all means please you know and all that and Denethor is like nope only him, <laughs> only mm. Boromir. So again, that's the film, though. So setting that aside. So okay. So the, thank you for the reminder, Jerry. Because yeah, I couldn't remember if he was mentioned at all. But yeah, Faramir seems almost like he should be too much of a surprise for the Hobbits in a weird way. Yeah. In, in a very weird way. It, it is one of those power dynamic things, especially since once Boromir is gone, both Faramir and especially Denethor can't get over that absence. And you know, the functioning of grief. Of a, of a father losing a son is very interesting in Tolkien, uh, especially as compared to, I brought him up r- briefly, Theoden and how he regards mm-hmm. his son. In Theoden's case, it's clearly deeply felt, but it's not really deeply dwelled on, and it's sort of like, we go forward. <laughs> and whereas Denethor cannot get over it, and it's, it's his trauma that's inescapable. That's very true for Boromir. What struck me the most was rereading the passages where, like, they brought Faramir in from Asgiliath and things are not looking good for him. And Pippin is, you know, keeping watch or, uh, you know, waiting upon Denethor. And as he watched, it seemed to him that Denethor grew old before his eyes as if something had snapped in his proud will and his stern mind was overthrown. Grief maybe had wrought it, and remorse. He saw tears on that once tearless face, more unbearable than wrath. Which, like, oh, I, f- I feel that. that. Part is so, I yeah. feel <laughs> that. <laughs> it's a gift of Tolkien that, uh, you know, we see characters described externally rather mm-hmm. than internally because he suggests the sense that Denethor has realized however much his mind or will is starting to like, you know, snap or break and all the rest of it. And some part of him has realized that he has screwed up badly mm-hmm. <laughs> and he has pushed someone to the brink and this is the result. And, and now it's sort of all has shattered and fallen apart, which of course is in striking contrast to what has happened before that. And I, this, this definitely refer to in the film because I think this is just an absolutely stellar moment that, that back and forth conversation between Faramir and Denethor before, the writing mm. out, which is, you know, that is that is that is a brutal scene. That mm-hmm. is that is emotional brinksmanship and power politics on a very deep level. Denethor is incredibly is openly suspicious and says so about Gandalf and uh, just you know being there and just you know the wizard's pupil is almost how he describes his son mm-hmm. and nothing more than that. And of course that you know famous that famous exchange which brilliantly rendered in the film. Uh, think of me when I, if I return. Think of me. That depends on the manner of your return. It's like think think better of me, father. Just oh, he's so good. <laughs> yeah, it just just uh, just amazing stuff. But 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 it really does. The sense of the sense of sacrifice, the sense of you know what are you willing to put yourself on the line for for your family and for your country? Yeah. Again, echoes of World War One, you could say, but echoes of just sort of like you know where are your sticking points? And maybe just hear it back to Faramir particularly. Let's talk about him as the incarnation of good, because this is this is almost the question: Is he too good a character for this milieu, or is he where he should be? I think I think he's fine. I I do too. But is 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 I is, need is, it. is is he too <laughs> ideal? <laughs> I don't I don't think he is too ideal because even though he consistently does the right thing, he's clearly struggling over what that is. Mm-hmm. 
it's not just like oh i know the way and we shall walk in it it's not he's not he's not (laughs) guiding he's he's on this road with everybody else so yeah i i don't i don't feel like he's too idealized or too perfect or too saintly because again he is struggling with what the right decision is and he that he makes the right decision is almost a matter of luck more than hmm. yeah. anything else. I mean, he's, he's wise and smart and everything, but he still is like, I don't know. Is this the right thing to do? I'm going to risk it. I'm going to risk it. And then he, and it also is narratively. I think you need that. I think you need that moment of them, like, because it comes right before all of the Kira Thungal stuff, mm-hmm. like you mm-hmm. need someone to do something nice and good mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> and i i think that kind of sets sets him up as this as this almost almost too good character but narratively it's just what you need mm-hmm. right then so i think you need a good boy <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i mean the thing is you know i i've i've heard the argument before and not least from again the uh, the Jackson team that uh, that his reaction to the ring seems to be too easy um, in the end that he's able to overcome that temptation too quickly. I I would disagree. I would say yeah. that we it's, it's it's not it's not Bormer's reaction for obvious reasons, uh, but it is something where you know he shows that flicker of going like oh this is what could happen and this is what it could do. Um, it's a nice little touch of drama you could say on Tolkien's part to almost have like it's it's almost the supervillain explaining his plans when he yeah. says like. Ah, I have the ring here and the power of two strangers. Ha, ah, and men in my command. You know, it's almost sort of like you're going down, and you know, it's sort of like the hobbits read this as sort of like he's serious, and then and, and then and then and then he laughs and says, and then his his reaction is not to to blame Boromir for falling temptation, just simply to say, you know, poor Boromir. You know, just almost mm-hmm. a sort of regretful. This is what happened. It's almost like he saw it coming. You know, it is, which is a very interesting and sad observation that he that he knew that this could be a path there. Something else what? about no. Go ahead, please. Oh well, what's interesting about the the Jackson argument that it's too easy for Boromir is that they give Aragorn that moment mm. where it is yes. like yes, Vigo shows that he is you know Vigo Mortensen shows that Aragorn is clearly conflicted about this, but he does it pretty easily. He rejects the ring, you know, he rejects mm-hmm. the ring and tells Frodo to run pretty pretty quickly and easily. So I'm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm calling calling some shenanigans here. <laughs> the, the the thing, another thing about the Hennetha Noon sequence, uh, where that all is, where the confrontation happens. Uh, I, I, I I just I really love that whole chapter. I think that's just you know just so very well done. Um, is uh, is how uh, is how Faramir how Faramir acts as the the gentle instructor to Frodo and Sam about deeper waters. And uh, Sam in particular feels it about sort of like how he suddenly feels less, sort of more rustic or untutored and things like this. So then and I think part of it's interesting is how he is is uh, through one of one of the literal handful. I mean, you know, even not even a complete collection of fingers on a hand of religious references per se in Tolkien in terms yeah. of observation, in terms of incarnation. That is, of course, the standing and looking to the West and honoring the memory of Numenor or what lies beyond it. You know, that's, you know, the equivalent of you know a, a, a prayer before dinner you know yeah. clearly is what it is and uh, and the fact that uh, that the hobbits don't know this and are taken by us is sort of like oh gosh there's something going on here and again the fact that Faramir does this but doesn't tell us like hey what you know he doesn't act like you know what do you people not know this stuff for <laughs> and things yeah. like that and so he demonstrates it and it's something that's felt internally instead like oh gosh you know like the, the little hint of these deeper waters <laughs> so which I think is just fascinating I also do love that moment uh where Faramir is like, oh, you guys don't do this? And they're like, no, but we do, like, thank our guests and bow to th- or thank our hosts and bow to them. And Faramir's like, yeah, we do that, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's just this funny little, like, no, don't you try and we do that, too. <laughs> Looping maybe now to Boromir, who, weirdly enough, sometimes, you know, sometimes I wonder if he gets short shrift, even though he's one of the nine members of the Fellowship and all the rest of it. But, of course, he's out of the story, is the point, you know, early on, uh, comparatively speaking. So we don't get as much time with him, and it's a great what if, you know, what if it hadn't happened. But, you know, Tolkien wrote the story the way he did. And I, I think that was important because, you know, otherwise the amount of loss shown in this struggle would have been fairly 
you know, limited when it came to your key characters. You know, he's he knew from his own experience that you can't go through something like this without losing people. So, you know, there's there's that as well. So there's there's no happy ending, and yet at the same time, it is meant to be a happy ending. He faced a he faced a test and realized he had done wrong, yeah. and that's that's the framing with Aragorn. But let's step back to the temptation. I think mm-hmm. is the way is the key thing there. It's clearly obvious as you read that Boromir is externalizing his struggle <laughs> in 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 the buildup. There's the back and forth in Lorien about like, you know, folly to throw away. Oh, you know, people are leaning in. It's almost like everyone's waiting for him. It's like, what do you mean? The whole bit about, I can't remember if it's Merry or Pippin, just sort of sitting on the riverboat and basically watching just sort of, you know, Boromir bite his nails and mumble to himself and get, get wound up. It's sort of like, you know, Tolkien's clearly setting you up yeah. <laughs> is what it is. You can't escape that. It's sort of like, okay, some sort of breaking point is reached. What's interesting is that when the moment comes, one, it's ultimately a self-obsessed monologue is what it is. It starts out as Boromir saying, I'm here to give you guidance, but he's not really. He's here basically to justify himself. It is a classic sentiment of self-justification for doing a terrible act is what yeah. it is. He's sort of like, okay, I'm about to basically rip this thing, <laughs> I'll steal this thing and all the rest of it, but it's for the greater good, you know, and all that. It's the type of thing you tell yourself when you're, you know, when you're going against that. When you are clearly about to do that. It's how he does it that's interesting and how Tolkien talks about it, because in another story with another author, we might get a lot more detail about what that is and how this plan is supposed to work. Tolkien is always very careful that he sells the fantasy of the ring. In other words, I can do this without actually getting into the reality of it. And the portrayal we get is not from within Boromir. Instead, it's Frodo watching a guy basically starting ranting and raving. You know, it's, it's, it's a hard sentiment. He kind of realizes without saying this that he's really literally going insane. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to find the words here. Portraying that character with sympathy can be hard. It's how do you come back from that? And I'm not saying Tolkien has some sort of deep insight into, you know, mental trauma or anything. I, I think he does with Gollum, clearly. It's sort of like, yeah. how do you do this? How do you do this with this character? And how do you do it in a sense of somebody who is theoretically being heroic and planning on the conquering of the thing? It's sort of like, it's not the answer. It's For not sure. the way. Yeah. You know, that, that's, a, that's a hard, fine line to do. But, I, you know, he does it. And that, I think, is what makes it so successful. Yeah, it's 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 a crucial moment. Because mm-hmm. I mean, we've seen we've seen plenty of people reject the ring. You know, Gandalf mm-hmm. says like no thanks. Galadriel says no thanks. But this is like we see what it actually does to mm-hmm. people who are in prolonged contact. Because like we have heard about Gollum, and you know, theoretically, people who have re- been you know people who are reading Lord of the Rings have read The Hobbit, mm-hmm. but they may not actually get a, a real good sense of that struggle until they get to that that moment with Boromir just really I think that like the major hint of that is when when Bilbo's face kind of transforms and of course there's a plane going above (laughs) I'm talking it's great um but you know so you get the you get these little hints like Bilbo's face kind of changing Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you hear about what the consequences would be It's really driven home with Boromir. And that is, I'm going to say that the Jackson movie is actually, it does it a little better. Mm. Um, Mm. For me, I think because Boromir is just a little built, he's built up a little better. Um, Mm. And Mm. I think that's mostly just because of Sean Bean um, and a few, like, very minor script changes, mm-hmm. uh, but I, I think it's mostly Sean Bean. He's just <laughs> just seems like a nice guy. I know. I, I get what you're getting at. I think there's that moment in this little scene where it's sort of the break moment before the Krabine arrive. The the crows are spying for Saruman, and they're doing the little sort of like you know sword training thing. And there's that bit where he gets knocked over and he laughs and things like. This. It's like okay, there's the there's a little charisma. It's not quite shown in Tolkien. You're right. Boromir is seen to be a dotty companion and things like mm-hmm. this, but you, you you there's there's a little there's there's not really any sense of you know those interactions and for maybe understandable reasons maybe that's not what Tolkien's you know focus or interest was but having yeah. something like that really suddenly is like ah you know that's kind of nice and that does make the early temptation moment in the film versus the book when they're trying to go up the mountain which is of course something that you know is you know using a line from what is the book's ultimate you know temptation moment instead is sort of like okay you know and again you're sort of signaling it clearly obviously but at the same time it's like well you know 
but there you, you then go. get distracted in the movie though you then get distracted by all the other stuff happening mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. it's it's just so much happening that you almost for you don't actually forget about it but you it is kind of driven driven to the back uh of your mind while you know gandalf dies you're like oh god <laughs> um, very very true so now speaking speaking of death let's get to the other big one that of course is denethor's death and oh, man. that may actually be the closest thing to something Game of Thrones like if we ever have to read it through this retroactive framing, because, you know, we have a we have a we have a scene of, you know, internal you know, internal house self slaughter. We have someone going against a guard going against other guards. We have, uh, you know, it's sort of like everything's piling, piling up and we have ultimately, of course, a father. You know, it's 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 a it's it's a twisted version of Abraham and Isaac. It's a father sacrificing a son on a burning altar, is what it is, or trying to. Um, but uh, in the sense of in the sense of you know, but instead of it being like the command of you know, the command of God in the, in that biblical example, this is more like somebody. And this is clearly Tolkien's big thing is he does not like despair. and uh, this the sense of ultimate despair, which leads to an interesting question. And this is maybe us reading back in literature that's now some decades old. Is there a distinction between despair and depression? And did Tolkien not understand depression? Oh. Because his other most famous suicide is the clearly tragic case of Turin Turambar. And that is, yeah. you know, its own fraught misery <laughs> and all that. And that's, that's, that is the working out of fate. And, you know, that's, that's, that's its own kettle of fish. In that case, you can, dare I say, kind of understand. I'm, let's not get into the Turin, uh, Turin story completely. But, uh, <laughs> but in this case, you know, that's, again, its own thing. In this case, however, you have uh, you have Gandalf, you know, basically telling Denethor, "What the heck are you doing?" He's basically invoking a religious reason. You know, only the heathen kings did this. You know, slaying the, slaying their offspring in their own madness, or facing death. You know, and all that. It's almost sort of like you know, there there's this thing there. But if we look at Denethor as a potentially depressed character, is that what he is though? I'm not sure hmm. because, you know, it's 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 the sense of it's a, but there's a sense of, you know, this sort of like is a tendency being fed already by other external sources. Was he already inclined to be sort of like, you know, pessimistic, <laughs> which I could argue he definitely is. But did that actually verge over into something where he was having a depressive break? You know, this is a hard area and this is not something I have, you know, true expertise and understanding but it's something that sort of like came to mind when looking at him again is sort of like here is somebody for whom very little seems to break him out of a certain mode to start with at all so i don't know i think there's a i think he does recognize the difference between depression and despair because Mm. i I, the way the way i see it anyway despair is kind of the the next evolution of depression okay i don't have chronic depression 2020 is really trying to change that. So I can't. <laughs> Don't blame you. I can't speak to like the actual mental illness of depression, but despair is very, I think, different where you have fully given up and depression is maybe on the verge of giving up. Maybe. Mm. It's, yeah, depression is the journey. Depression is the journey and despair is the destination is, mm. is my thoughts on that. Like, yeah, it's it's and I do, I don't think that's what Tolkien thought. I don't Right, yeah. But that is the the actions that Denethor takes are the actions of a man looking for control, looking to retake control of his life, you know, at what he believes is the utmost end. Tragic or would it is tragic. It's, it is tragic, it's, yeah. It's genuinely um a huge bummer. <laughs> <laughs> uh but it is, yeah. I think I think that's my interpretation. Is is Denethor just flailing, looking for a way to regain control as it slips from him in every other way? Mm-hmm. You know, it does not help that Aragorn is skulking around, possibly <laughs> taking his power away. Yeah, he's trying to take his power back in a really, in in the wrong way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, ever seen. And the, uh, it just suddenly occurred to me as you were speaking, maybe another key difference here is that if, again, as my, as I understand it, don't, don't, uh, this is, I, I'm just trying to uh, put this out there, is that um, if, uh, if 
what we understand to be depression is something where you, if you are in it, you look at everything and nothing provides joy because you're looking at it through your own lens. In Lord of the Rings, the exacerbation comes courtesy particularly through the Palantir and Sauron's warping of it. In other words, it's mm -hmm. an external direction. Yeah. It's an external misinformation. And that yeah. is something that is discussed and brought up. So that is uh, – which is interesting. I mean, you know, this is not a complaint. This is merely sort of showing how there's – the maybe the argument is more that, uh, you know, susceptibility, how you read things, how you mm -hmm. understand reading things from particular sources – um, is what it is. And that, remember, that ties into a thought, too, about what uh, what Denethor's solution to the ring is. He, he does want the ring, but he doesn't want the ring. He wants to take the ring and bury it, hide it, keep it away. He basically wants to sort of like, you know, sort of like, let's make sure no one can use it. And uh, this is something that Gandalf's like, that's not how it works. <laughs> right. Is that is that a lie that Denethor is telling himself, or does he truly think that he could uh, withstand the pressure, mm -hmm. you know, he, that he could withstand the call of the ring? I'm not... I think he thinks he could withstand yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. I think he believes in his own strength, which is how the, the Palantir got him that way. He was yeah. like, oh, I can... I can do this. I can use this. And he's so explicitly angry at Faramir for not bringing the ring to him. You know, mm -hmm. he's he that 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 ties back into you know uh, you know a superior commanding it at a uh, someone under his command a you know a reader of a nation commanding a, the heir to the now heir to the throne he's going like and you chill it away going like why did you do this thing you know and uh, and he, he he in a weird way it parallels it parallels what Gandalf says about Sauron in this sense. Gandalf says at one point that Sar the, the idea that we would actually want to get rid of the ring, destroy the ring, has never entered Sauron's mind. Yeah. You know, yeah. so see, Sauron's at that sort of like absolute level. Similarly, Denethor can't imagine the idea of taking the ring to go destroy it and actually seeming to give it away. He absolutely cannot. You know, they are two different, very different people, very different beings in, in the scheme of uh, Middle Earth's creation. But uh, they, they, they're kind of polar opposites in that regard. They don't see what Gandalf is doing. And and, uh, and, uh, and and it shows, I guess is the best way to put it. So fascinatingly wrong. Yeah, no, the, the image of Denethor dying, which, of course, we don't directly see. It's mediated. Mm. You know, he goes, he, he goes in, he breaks the he breaks his rod, he lays down and then, you know, everyone stands back. and You just hear this deep cry from within. You know, it's it's a painful, miserable, horrible death, you know, and that's you know, that's and it's it's something that the sheer unease of it, the sense that, yes, the you know, this is, you know, the, for the days of Gondor, for good or evil, they have ended, you know, the days of Gondor, as we know before, to, to borrow from the book, it's a, it is something I think too is, and maybe this ties back into kind of how I was half introducing the discussion for everything here. Tolkien's clearly had his belief in the beyond, but he clearly also had an issue with the structures of command and government as they were in the world. Mm. And in a weird way, having this case was sort of like, you know, this sort of structure of society being wiped out at the same time that the, that the, that the, that Sauron soon is soon to fall and the great temptation soon to fall is kind of like, it's almost like a, not quite a total cleansing, but it's definitely a reordering. It's yeah. sort of yeah. like going like, you know, yeah, we got rid of the great evil, but look what was happening here. And, you know, yeah. he clearly, is not happy with, and we talked about this in the imperialism episode, but he clearly is not happy with Gondor as it stands. And he clearly, you know, it's almost like Denethor could never have made it <laughs> into that. You know, if it hadn't been one thing, it would have been another. Whereas Faramir is the one who adapts. He is the one who kind of recognizes his place and recovers. And, you know, it's not that the book dwells on the fact that both his father and his brother are now dead, but it's almost seen to be the fact that he almost accepts it. And, and moves on mm -hmm. in not so many words. And that's, you know, is that a question of, is that a conscious choice? Is that a sin of omission on Tolkien's part to not talk about it? I don't know. I don't think there's any one exact answer there. But I think it's the fact that he didn't prioritize it almost as sort of him mm -hmm. recognizing it. Sort of like Fermier is like, man, this is how it happened. You know, he's, he seems to be utterly unsurprised mm -hmm. <laughs> is what it yeah. is, that his father and his brother ended up the way they did is maybe the best way to put it. So, it, Like, you know, maybe it is the sort of, for Faramir, it's him finally being free of the man who resented him and the brother who was always, you know, the golden child. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he no longer has to deal with that. Good right. for you, man. Yeah. yeah. 
Good job, Faramir. Get made out of the toxic through. system however you can. Right? <laughs> You've got a hot wife now. Yeah. <laughs> however quick that courtship happened. But right? hey, it happened. It was all good. <laughs> Five days. That's all it takes for Faramir to lock lock someone down. <laughs> I don't blame her. <laughs> Uh, so, well, I've, I've kind of said what I had to say. So do any of you, either of you have particular final thoughts about these three characters, how they function, what they're, what they're like in them of themselves? Sort of, but are they fully formed? I don't know. <laughs> uh, Throw it at us. <laughs> it's, I don't know, going back sort of to the sort of political mm. role of the play. I don't know. I just find it really interesting that politics characters interested in politics characters that do all that only really show up at the end like Mm. he clearly doesn't care about that kind of thing and it's Mm -hmm. or cares about it enough to put it in but not enough to make it the focus and putting it in right as the war really becomes a war rather than a stalemate or a cold war is Mm -hmm. purposeful somehow like if if you Going back to his letters, Faramir was a surprise to him in the way that other things were as well, where just Mm. all of a sudden, oh, this guy shows up and he starts talking about this stuff. And oh, no, now we've got to slot this into everything else. Like, (laughs) like, we've got to we've got to reckon with Faramir being a different kind of human from any other kinds of humans that we've seen, similar to Aragorn, but Mm -hmm. still pretty different. Yeah, I just I wonder what it says about the work or what the work is trying to say by putting politics in the story only to juxtapose war Mm. or maybe not only, but it, you know, what am I trying to say? (laughs) I said they weren't fully formed. (laughs) Do you think that that's because for him, the end result of politics always is war or like that's sort of the natural, natural result of nations that are overly political. Mm -hmm. No, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's it's almost like reading it through the lens of his what we have of the history of Numenor is instructed there in terms of power politics, you know, noble houses, things like that playing out, and almost sort of like you know, there's there's history. It's 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 kind of funny, you know. Tolkien creates an elaborate backstory of history for the realm, and at the same time, and you know, delves into with unfinished stories and things like this. But at the same time, he never, you know, he doesn't really flesh it out, and he doesn't foreground it. Yeah, it's it it, it is ultimately skeletal, and it's almost sort of like you know that that makes Denethor's evident interest and obsession with history, you could say, and with roles. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. And Jared, I think, would agree with me on this. You know, it's the closest you could argue that uh, that that uh, that this sense of very particular ceremony in all these thousands of years is the closest, arguably, say that Lord of the Rings gets to something like Gormenghast by Murray. You know, these these this uh, this oppressive sense of, you know, we follow the forms because we follow the forms and we Mm -hmm. will follow them just all the (laughs) way down the line. Yeah, no, it does. Yeah, that's the closest that it comes to. Yeah. Oriana, any final thoughts yourself? My final thought is that I need to read Gorman Guest now. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Like I've yes, been meaning do. to. I need to. <laughs> I will acquire a copy. <laughs> well, there, and we recommend that to you all for mm-hmm. for sure. So, but if there is not much else to say, this seems like as good a spot as any to wrap it up. So, uh, yeah, just um, I I said I had you know almost said everything to say, but yeah, no, the three of them. It's one of those things that uh, you know maybe a final thing is ultimately unanswerable, and that is what role that Denethor's wife, their mother played, you know, this is something simply not explored. It's the type of thing that fanfic could go into, you know, a lot, I'm sure. And it's interesting to has. note that John Noble, <laughs> who played Denethor, uh, spoke in the commentary uh, for Lord of the Rings about how he factored that into his performance, about uh, the loss of the mother, and that apparently, that as he saw it, and I don't think this is in Tolkien at all, but it's a very interesting riff on the idea, as he saw it, that Boromir... Uh, favored Denethor more in terms mm. of like a look and attitude, whereas Faramir reminded him of his of the of the lost wife, things like this, which is a nice actorly touch to bring to an interpretation of the story. It's not Tolkien, but it's an interesting way to look at it, and it's sort of like just one of those like ah, you know, that's a nice that's a nice thing to bring to something, even though it's not necessarily what's in the story, and we just don't know. So it's just one of those. It really it really works, and 
By the way, shout out to John Noble, who is a very lovely guy. I had to interview him. He was a guest star on The Good Wife, and I was writing about it back at TV Guide magazine, and he was so lovely. So, shout out. All right, so we've got next time coming around, it is Oriana's turn. Oriana, what is the subject we're going to talk about as you settle into the West Coast? <laughs> yeah, because I will be, you know, I will have just arrived and will not have a whole lot available to me in terms of material, uh, we're going to talk about Eowyn. All right. <laughs> um, we, we had like a lengthy Slack conversation, I don't know, a couple months ago yes. or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I would like to get back to that. There's a number of different things we can talk about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Tolkien's women issues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can discuss those. We can discuss whether, you know, adaptational changes. Um, and also, you know, uh, is her deciding to no longer be a shield maiden feminist or not feminist? Mm -hmm. I've got thoughts <laughs> and you guys will too. So... <laughs> As good a subject as any we've done, we've done talking about three characters. Let's focus on one. <laughs> That's all I can handle. Yes. That's all I can handle. <laughs> it, 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 it'll, it'll be a good choice. We'll also say that uh, we will be aiming to get uh, that next episode to you a little sooner uh, than that, basically, because we were looking at the schedules like, uh, let's try and get this one out to maybe just before the election, because God knows what it's going to be like trying to record after it, because we really don't know what our minds are going to be <laughs> like. Nobody knows. <laughs> we'll, we'll get that out, and then by the time the next episode after that gets done, we'll be like, okay, now we know what's going on. Eh, hopefully. <laughs> so uh, we'll we'll see about that. Um, otherwise, uh, yes, next time next time you hear from us, uh, Oriana will be in California. The West Coast uh, will we'll start we'll start the new episode by singing into the West. No, we won't. And <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we will take it from there. So, uh, as always, we'll have other news, other things, A1 discussion next time. Until that time, thank you again very much for listening. We do appreciate it. As always, contact information is in our outro. Send us notes, send us whatever, and we'll talk to you then. Thanks very much. Until then. Thanks again for listening to this episode of By the Bywater. Please subscribe and rate us via your favorite podcast listening options. Episodes and show notes are at megaphonic.fm slash by the bywater, all one word. You can also message us through here. Email us at by the bywater at megaphonic.fm or follow us on Twitter at by the bywater. You can also follow us individually on Twitter and ask questions there. I'm at Vandroid Helsing. I'm at Schwinter, S-C-H-W-I-N-D-T-E-R. And I'm Ned Raggett, two G's, two T's. By the Bywater is a proud member of Megaphonic Podcast Network. Find all our fancy little shows at megaphonic.fm. We hope you join us again next time. Until then, Namarieh.